So we pick up the story on page 138. I want to I go a little bit out of order here so we can see the chronology of how this developed. So first we're going to look at the, the reasons for the exile. And to do that, we've got to start on page 142. So flip down or scroll down to page 142. Uh, Moses, the great leader of the people of Israel uh, out of the, the Exodus story, we've looked at that in Redemption Wandering Movement. Moses, in the book of Deuteronomy, this second sermon that he gave to the people of Israel, this long retelling of the law. In the book of Deuteronomy, it closes the final uh, chapters of Deuteronomy, chapters 28 through the end. It closes with Moses begging the people of Israel to trust Yahweh, to obey Him. And He gives some things that will happen if you obey and things that will happen if you disobey. And we notice here Moses' admonition. He says, the commandment I'm giving you, hey listen people, listen Israel, these commandments that I'm giving you today to trust the Lord, it's not too hard for you. Look at verse 14. The Word, this Torah, the law of the Lord, it's near to you, it's in your mouth, it's in your heart, so that you can, underline it, do it, so that you can obey. So you can trust me. And then Moses gives this great appeal. It's one, of, it's, one of the, it's one of the most sweet and sincere parts of the scripture. And uh, I want you just to see it. It's printed for you right here. Ch chapter 30, verse 15 and following. Moses says, See, I have set before you today. And you can put a little number one and a little number two. It's a choice. Number one, the choice is between life and good. And number two, between death and and evil. How do you receive each? How do you know you're getting the one or the other? Look at what he says, verse 16. If, if you obey, if you obey my commandment, you love the Lord, you walk in His ways, you keep His commandments, then, when you see if then, I always double underline the if and the then and draw an arrow to connect that this is a conditional statement. If you do this, then that will happen. And oftentimes in Scripture, when we see those if thens, it helps us to kind of remind ourselves what we're doing here. So if you do this, then you'll live and you'll multiply and God will bless you. You will, you will be the blessing and you'll be that treasured possession and that kingdom of priests that will bless the nations. But, look at verse 17, but, you might even circle that, when you do your own personal quiet time or personal Bible study, note contrasting words, connecting words in sentences and paragraphs like but, therefore, so that, that, for, these kinds of words. But, here we have a contrast. If your heart turns away, if your heart turns away, and you don't hear, and you worship other gods, and you serve other gods, then you will perish. It won't go well for you. Look at what he says at the end of verse 19. Therefore, Moses says, choose life that you may live, loving God and obeying Him and holding fast. He is your life. This is a trust book. And he's asking them to choose to trust and obey Yahweh. And this is Moses' final declaration, his final admonition to the people. And that was given hundreds of years before the events that we're going to look at when we talk about the exile. So turn back to page 138, and we call this the demise, the demise of Israel. Moses says, trust and obey, and it'll go well for you. And instead, they'll do the opposite. They will refuse to trust, refuse to obey. We saw this in the kingship divided, if you recall. When the people of Israel rebel against the people of Judah and the civil war breaks out, the very first thing that the king of Israel, Jeroboam, will do is he will institutionalize idol worship. He builds two golden calves and now the, the people called Israel, these ten northern tribes, they are beginning in idolatry. It's not a good start. And we saw that all of their kings were bad. And as we, as we get to the last king, what we see is this. Look at verse 2. Hosea did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, yet not as the kings of Israel who were before him. He was worse. He trusted God worse than any of the kings that came before. And as a result, now this is where our Bible gets weird and confusing and we don't know what's going on. This is why we're taking panoramas so you can make sense of this. Against him, as a result of Hosea and all the previous kings that came before him, this is in 722 B.C., God raises up Shalmaneser, king of Assyria. Now, if, you read, if you're reading along in your Bible, oftentimes this is where you get confused and frustrated. So help go along with us here. Let's, we'll try to make sense of it. Shalmaneser is the king of Assyria. Hosea had become what we call a vassal. He was paying tribute 
to the king of Assyria for protection. But what we're seeing in our story is he double-crossed him. Look what happens. But the king of Assyria found treachery in Hosea, for he had sent messengers to Saw, king of Egypt. In other words, he was double-crossing the king of Assyria and now asking the king of Egypt to come and help him defeat Assyria. But Shalmaneser found out about it. And now, here comes the king of Assyria to invade all the land. And he came to Samaria, which is another way to another name for those ten northern tribes of Israel. He came and invaded the land. I want you to underline the word invaded. This is a tragic, terrible note. A foreign power is now coming in and invading God's people. For three years he besieged it. In the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria, he captured Samaria, he carried the Israelites away to Assyria, and he he scattered them among the Assyrian Empire. We're going to talk in a minute about what the Assyrian foreign policy looked like, but we note the reasons. Look at why. God says why this happened. Verse, uh, letter C, the reasons for the exile. Note them. I'm going to have you note. It's actually nine. There's nine reasons listed here. And this occurred, circle the word because. This is another one of those connecting words. For me, I'm a double, I double underline there, therefore, so that, because. Figure out your way to make the scripture come alive to you. He, all this occurred because, I'm going to give you a little number one, two, three, four, so you can write them down. The people of Israel, number one, they sinned against the Lord. Number two, they feared other gods. Number three, they walked in the customs of the nations whom the Lord drove out. Number four, they did secretly against the Lord things that were not right. Number five, they built for themselves high places or places of worship. Number six, they set up for themselves pillars of Asherim, these false these false places of worship where they worship the gods, the god, goddess Asherah. Number seven, they made offerings on high hills, where, on high places where they would go and worship, the, worship false gods up on these high places where they thought they were getting closer to the gods. Number eight, they did wicked things, provoking the Lord to anger. Nine, they served idols, the very thing God said not to do. God had told them over and over, look at 2 Kings 17. He said, turn, keep, turn from this, repent, stop doing this, keep my commandments, and yet turn the page. The people would not listen. Verse 14 of 2 Kings 17, just circle that. They would not listen. Look at the verbs as this story unfolds. Verse 15, they despised his statutes, the statutes of Yahweh. They went after false idols. They followed the nations that were around him. They abandoned their com the commandments of God. They made for themselves golden calves. They worshiped Baal. They, look how bad this got. Verse 17, they burned their sons and their daughters as offering and used divination and omens and sold themselves, sold themselves to do what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Let's talk about the Canaanite gods for just a moment. Uh, Baal was a fertility god in the Canaanite region that the Israelites found themselves constantly they, they were constantly fooled by going to worship Baal. They constantly were struggling with worshiping Baal. Here's how Baal was worshipped. He was a fertility god, and it was believed by the ancient Canaanites, and the Israelites fell victim to the same thing, that Baal was the, the deity who provided rain for our crops and fertility, as in like new offspring of your livestock and even your own children. So you want Baal to be favorable to you. The problem with Baal is he gets... He gets a little bit sidetracked. He can be a little bit aloof. It's hard to keep Baal focused on fertilizing your lamb with rain. And so the way you get him focused, because he's a fertility god, he gets focused, he gets aroused, and he responds to your particular situation when you arouse him, when you pique his interest. And to do that, oftentimes Baal was worshipped by engaging in cult prostitute sex at the Baal temple. What you're hoping is Baal will be aroused and then will come and fertilize your land by being aroused by the sex act that's taking place. It's gross. It's vile. Asherah is a very similar thing, except Asherah was worshipped under big tall trees in the ancient part of Canaan. And then Molech was a god that demanded child sacrifice, another Canaanite god. And the Israelites, what we're seeing is the people of the northern kingdom of Israel are falling victim to worshiping and serving these gods over and over and over again. And the reason they're carried into exile is because they fell victim to the same 
in the same exact dadgum power of sin that keeps owning and enslaving over and over and over again. As the story is unfolding, and we've been drawing this over and over and over again, as the story is unfolding, this power called sin is continually at work. As the people of Israel are called to be a blessing that goes out into the nations, the people of Israel find themselves just like Adam and Eve before, and just like the family of Abraham now, the people of Israel are finding themselves enslaved by that very same power. And instead of blessing going out, the power of darkness and idolatry is going out. This force, this power called sin is strong and it keeps winning. And what it says is, therefore, verse 18, the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them out of his sight. None was left but the tribe of Judah only. But look at verse 19. Judah also did not keep the commandments. And now as we move to the demise of Judah, we're going to see that their demise will take place about 140 years later. The Assyrian captivity is in 722, and the, the captivity by Babylon will be in 586. And we see a very similar note. Look at page 141. Zedekiah, he's the king of Judah. Uh, in 586, was 21 years old when he became king. He reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. We get his mother's name. That's helpful. And then verse 19, underline it. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that Jehoiakim had done, his, the, his predecessor. For because of the anger of the Lord, it came to the point in Jerusalem and Ju in Judah that he, underline it, he cast them out from his presence. So what we see is the very same thing that happened with Israel will be the very same thing that happens with Judah. And this will begin for us. You can see it listed here on the map on page 141. The king of Babylon will carry the people of Judah up and around that desert area and down into the nation of Babylon in 586. And this is going to begin our lep process of being boxed in in exile. And then we'll turn in a moment and describe uh, what that looks like.